the main shock was off the coast of Sumatra, which had sort of been written off as a place unlikely to have big earthquakes. The earthquake went on and on for about 10 minutes. It was one of the longest earthquakes ever recorded, and it had a magnitude of 9.2. Instead of people running from the sea after they felt the shaking, they really did nothing until it was too late, until they saw the water coming in. And you can't outrun the tsunami then. It was one of the deadliest disasters in history. More than 225,000 people killed in 11 countries. Dozens of villages, towns, and entire coastal areas completely destroyed. The 2004 Sumatra earthquake and tsunami stunned the world, including those who are familiar with such events. There was a sort of shock and surprise by the whole geologic and tsunami community about having something that big and that devastating. A subduction earthquake like that is it's a disaster, but it's also an opportunity to learn something about Sumatra and, and something also that can be applied to other places, Cascadia and elsewhere. Earthquakes can happen in almost any state in the U.S. 40 out of 50 states have moderate to very high earthquake risk, affecting more than 75 million Americans. In the past, Magnitude 6 and 7 earthquakes have struck on the East Coast, from Boston and New York to Charleston, South Carolina. In the Midwest, four of the largest earthquakes ever to occur in the continental U.S. devastated the region in 1811 and 1812. Moving west, Salt Lake City and Nevada have earthquake hazards. California unquestionably has the largest population at risk to earthquakes in the United States. And in 1964, Alaska's 9.2 earthquake was the largest ever recorded in the U.S. But perhaps the region that is most striking in similarity to Sumatra is Cascadia, the 700-mile-long expanse from northern California to southern British Columbia. The Cascadia region experiences large subduction zone earthquakes, an average of once every 500 years. The U.S. and Canada also experience damaging earthquakes in this region once every few decades. Started way in the north of the Andaman Islands. Chris Goldfinger and other scientists went to Sumatra to do what they've already done in the U.S. Use turbidite paleoseismology to look at submarine landslides and tell the story of past earthquakes. We know now from Sumatra that one segment of the subduction zone that went off in December 2004 triggered the next segment to the south um, just three months later in 2005. And so just basic information about how the segments of a big fault interact is applicable to other, other fault systems including Cascadia. And so the more we learn about each one, the more we learn about the process as a whole. How structures will hold up to large earthquakes is the focus of shake table tests at the University of Nevada at Reno. For the first time anywhere in the world, a four-span bridge was tested with a series of seismic simulations, some the equivalent of a magnitude 8.0 earthquake. The lab is part of NICE, Network for Earthquake Engineering Simulation, and funded by the National Science Foundation. Over 400 sensors on the structure were used to compile data that was broadcast live to scientists and engineers around the world. I think one of the most unique aspects of NICE is the fact that it brings together multiple institutions. Instead of it being one institution trying to attack an earthquake engineering problem by itself, you have a group of laboratories that are being brought together to try to solve major earthquake engineering problems that we haven't been able to solve before. The uh, Sumatran earthquake went on and on for about 10 minutes. So just imagine that strong ground motion going on for several minutes. A building stands up fine and then, you know, for 30 seconds, but then it's going to collapse if you keep shaking it. Research at Oregon State University's Tsunami Wave Basin Lab is also helping engineers learn how to build structures that will withstand or dissipate earthquakes, tsunamis, or even hurricanes. It's interesting to me to see how they apply the information that's collected 
by geologists in order to improve engineered structures on the coast. And I think it's extremely important to show in terms of seaside Oregon because it, it raises awareness and it, it's a very good educational tool. Also a part of Nice, the Tsunami Lab is the world's largest facility for studying the effects of large waves, enabling scientists and engineers to share data with researchers around the world. Guided tours for emergency managers and other officials help bring understanding to what a massive earthquake and tsunami would mean for their communities. There's not going to be any homes or buildings for people to go back to. We might be able to get people out of that town, but if they're not able to go back, then we've got to figure out a way to, to shelter those people for, for what's going to be days or weeks, especially in inclement weather. While a tsunami poses a real threat along the coast, many scientists and officials believe a large earthquake will have a much greater impact on the nation and the entire region. The tsunami is going to be near total devastation, but it'll, it'll be in a very narrow band along the coast. The earthquake's going to reach hundreds of miles inland. What this event, what Cascadia is going to do to our national economy, when you shut down the I-5 traffic, the rail traffic, the port traffic, the airport traffic, these are huge implications that, that need more attention. Which leads to the subject of resiliency. How does the nation recover from such a catastrophic event? Resiliency is being able to get through to the disaster and, and come out again, and come out of it and be able to rebuild your community back again. If you can recover the economy, a lot of the other damaged or impacted areas come back naturally, such as schools. If people are going to work, earning their living, things are returning to normal, then the schools are going to return to normal. We have to maintain and sustain our economic well-being, and we do that by becoming more resilient to these kinds of events. From issues of resiliency to the latest cutting-edge research, scientists, engineers, and emergency managers are committed to learning the lessons from massive earthquakes and how they can be applied across North America. I'd like to learn this before we have our earthquake. We could have our earthquake tomorrow or we could have it a century from now, but we can do things to lessen the damage and lessen the impact.